me, but I, I do want to, um, I, I want to dive in uh, to God's Word first thing. Uh, so go ahead and grab your Bible with me. We're going to turn to Colossians chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we want you to follow along in God's Word. So what you can do is there should be a Bible in the chair back in front of you. You can grab a Bible. If you don't own a Bible, if, if you've never owned a Bible, go ahead and uh, grab this one, write your name in it, take it home with you. We want that to be a gift. We, I promise we don't have any library uh, book detectors on the way out. No alarm is going to go off. You can take this home with you. Uh, just write your name in it so you know it's yours. If you're using the same Bible I am, which is one of the church Bibles, it's uh, on page 711, Colossians. Uh, we're in chapter 1. What I want to do before we even dive into the real heart of our teaching series called Director's Chair is I want to spend a little bit of time uh, showing you how passionate Paul was for the sake of the gospel. And I want to ask for permission for a minute to be vulnerable with you about something that stood out to me personally that I want to share with you all. Uh, We'll start in chapter 1, verse 24. It says, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body. Um, Pause right there. Does that not sound weird to anybody here? That somebody would say, hey, I'm really glad that I am suffering. Uh, This already sounds really unique. So what Paul is communicating is outside of the way our minds normally function. He says, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the suffering of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret. Anyone like a good secret? All right, here we go. We we got one coming, all right? It says, this message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. I want to know what it is, so let's, let's keep reading. It says, for God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too, and this is the secret. Are you ready? Here it comes. Christ lives in you. What an awesome thing. The the fact that for generations this secret had been kept from God's people, that Christ now through his Holy Spirit lives inside of you. What an incredible truth. And then it keeps going. It says, this gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given to us. We want to present them to God perfect in the relationship to Christ. That's why I struggle so hard depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. So this verse that you're looking at on the screen right now, this idea of Paul saying, listen, the the gospel is so important to me. It's such an incredible message. It's so powerful, the truth of what God has done It's so amazing that that I am willing and gladly struggle to proclaim it. In fact, when Paul wrote Colossians, he was sitting in prison for his faith. He was sitting with Timothy, who was also in prison. One of his disciples was in prison with him because of the fact that they were sharing this idea of Jesus coming and being God's son and dying and being resurrected. So they are in prison for their faith, and Paul says this, That's why I work and struggle so hard. I want to really relate with Paul here for a moment. Let me, this is me being vulnerable. Um, Clearly, I'm not in prison for my faith. I have never been in prison for my faith before. I'm not struggling in my faith the same way that Paul is talking about struggle here But when he talks about this idea that that the truth of leading people to the truth is so important to him that that it's a struggle, that he works hard at it. That's something that I have learned to really relate with because I want to be honest with you. These past three years, my first three years and the last, they're the same three years in ministry, this has become, and I've learned, the hardest job I've ever had. It is a struggle. And let me tell you why. Because when you lead, when you're truly leading, you're not necessarily taking people where they want to go. 
Listen, if I was just, as your pastor, as the shepherd of this church, those of you who call ACC home, those of you who are visiting or you haven't decided yet about this place, uh, you can tune me out for a moment. For those of you who said, I want to be under the shepherding of this church, if I was just leading this church exactly where you wanted to go, is that really leading at all? Or am I just walking with you? You see, the truth is that as a pastor, I've been called to lead into uncomfortable, hard, and probably the most costly mission field you'll have ever experienced in your life. And as a a good shepherd knows that when he's leading his sheep, he's got to take sheep through dark valleys and high cliffs and places that sheep don't want to go. And the result of that, I'm learning in ministry, is that not a day goes by that I don't hear about someone in the church frustrated about something we're doing or something they don't like or the fact that Matt's not leading this church the way they like. And in the midst of all the incredible things that God is doing right now, the way our church is growing and thriving, I don't think I should be surprised that as we're walking and and being led together uh, by God into this this ministry and the things that God is doing, that there's gonna be seasons where It's just hard. It's just over and over again. Sometimes it feels like getting punched in the stomach. Man. And yet, in relating with Paul, he says at the very beginning of this passage, I do it with joy. And I'm also learning, man, this is the least last three years have easily been my favorite three years uh, of my life. See, Paul has this intense love for this church and for Christ followers. And he says in the NIV version, instead of saying the word struggle so hard, he uses the phrase, um, basically the way he words it is, I give all my energy. If you've ever been on a sports team, right, the coach tells you at the beginning of the game, listen, I want you to go out there and I want you to leave it all out on the field. Don't you come back into my locker room at the end of this game with energy left over, with strength still to give, with fight still in you. I want you to go out there and I want you to give everything you have because the mission of winning and defeating the enemy is that crucial to us. Go out there and give it all you've got. And Paul is saying, I have that kind of energy. I want to go out there and give it all, give everything I've got, pour myself out for the sake of of helping people meet Jesus and leading people to follow him. This is an intense love that that Paul has. There's a story, a true story, about a guy named John Harper. John Harper um, lost his life. Um, He he was one of the the guys who was on the Titanic. There was a church in Chicago named the Moody Church, and today uh, many of you still know of this church. They now have the Moody Bible Institute, and at the Moody Church, they had invited John Harper, who was a, a preacher and evangelist on the other side of the ocean, to come and teach on a Sunday morning and at a revival that the church was having. So they sent a message over. He said he was going to do it, and he ended up getting himself a ticket on the Titanic to come to America to teach. And as we know, the Titanic only had one voyage. And at midnight one night, it hit an iceberg, right? And and everyone on board quickly found out that the boat was going down. And John Harper, uh, the stories of the people who survived the Titanic, talk about what he was doing. He was going up and down the decks of the Titanic, sharing the gospel with anybody that would listen. Sir, do you know Jesus? Ma'am, do you know Jesus? Have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? He knew full well that for many people on that boat, this was going to be their last day. He had an urgency to his message. In fact, John Harper was a widower. His wife had passed away, and they had a daughter, and his daughter was with him. So on this boat, they, they made a space for him. They realized, this is your daughter. You're the only living parent here. We have room for you on this boat. And he purposely gave up his seat. He put his daughter in the boat, and he said, someone else needs this space more than I do. And then as he's going up and down, as the boat is, is sinking, he's, he's sharing the gospel with every breath he has in him, and finally he finds himself in the icy cold waters of the Atlantic Ocean, and he's swimming up from person to person, saying, sir, do you know Jesus? He's sharing the gospel with anyone who will listen to him. And one guy in particular, 
I wasn't wearing a life vest, and John Harper said, sir, do you know Jesus? And he says, I don't. And he took off his life vest and said, you, you need this more than I do. And he shared the gospel with him and, and, and died there in the Atlantic Ocean. And this gentleman survived. He was one of the few people that was found alive floating in the water. And he wrote an article years later uh, entitled, I Was the Last Convert of John Harper. He shared this story about this man whose passion was so strong, just like we see here for Paul, that the gospel was so real and so important and so intense that he, he was willing to do whatever it took, including giving his own life so that somebody else might recognize the truth of Christ. We read on, you want to keep seeing how intense Paul's love is for these people at this church in Colossae in chapter 2, if we keep reading. It says, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers, listen to this, who have never met me personally. Here's the, the, the crazy thing about the church in Colossae. Paul did not start this church. He had never been to this church. He had never been to Laodicea. He's talking and praying and telling you he's agonizing over and sharing his heart in this letter to a people that he has never met face to face before. If I'm being vulnerable again, I struggle to pray for my own family sometimes. I struggle to pray for my church I have to set reminders in my phone to remember to just stop and spend some time in prayer. And Paul is saying, listen, I agonize over you, people I've never met. Verse two, it says, I want, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. See, so here's what's happening here. Paul understands and has recognized the importance of a relationship with Christ in such an intense way that he's saying, I gladly suffer and agonize to share this message even with strangers. I want everyone to know about the love of Jesus Christ. And the word that keeps popping out to me, we're going to open in, in prayer here in, in a moment. One word that keeps popping out to me is the word, I have agonized for you. And when I hear the word agonize, if, I, if I'm picturing myself in a position of agonizing, this isn't the posture I would be in. So if you would humor me for a moment, I'm going to pray for us, but I'm going to take a different posture. I'm going to I get on my knees for a moment and agonize on behalf of our church. And I want to invite you, if you're, if you're able, if you're physically able and willing, um, and you profess the name of Christ and want to join me uh, on your knees, let's uh, open in prayer together in that posture. Father God, I am... Um, I recognize that there is a brokenness in your world and in this church and there are people even in this congregation right now that don't know you. They're separated from you and the abundant life you have planned for them and even in this church, God, myself included, there are followers of Christ who aren't taking direction from you the way we ought to. And God, I pray right now, I agonize on behalf of this body God, I pray that you would reveal yourself in a mighty way this morning. That you would help us to see areas in our lives where we have taken direction from this world instead of from you. Allow us to spot those instances and to be willing and, and have the strength and the courage to do something about it today before we leave. God, I give you this time. I pray that you would do a mighty work in it. Forgive us, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So as we're in this series called Director's Chair, ultimately here's the gist of the series. We're going through the book of Colossians together. We're going through this, this book that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. And the problem was is that there's this concept, there, there is a place of authority in your life. We, we talked last week about how Jesus is supreme. We all know now who the director is. Christ is the director, whether you like it or not. But what happens in our lives and what was happening within the church in Colossae is that they weren't taking direction from Christ. They had taken Christ out of his rightful place of the director's chair and they were putting other things in that chair. Or they were trying to stack other things in that chair with Christ, along with Christ, saying we're gonna take direction from different places. And, and one of the things that we're, we see here in this chapter two of Colossians is that sometimes we take direction from the world. That's what we're gonna talk about today. What does it look like when we take direction from the world? Next week, we're gonna talk about taking direction from other people and from influences in our lives, friends and family. And on the third week of our series, we're gonna talk about what it looks like when we take direction from ourselves, when we put ourselves in the place of the director. So today, taking direction from the world, uh, let's dive right in. Colossians chapter two, right where we left off, verse four. Here's what it says. It says, I am telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. When you see that word, well-crafted, does that word crafty, crafted, does that remind you of anything in the Bible? You remember in Genesis chapter three, the story of the fall, uh, God had created everything and it was good. And then he says the serpent was the craftiest of all God's creation. That the serpent hanging out trying to, to trick and deceive is craftier than anything else God had made. You ought to, when you look at this verse, think for a moment, hey, I'm telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted, who does that remind you of? It ought to remind you of Satan, the evil one. And we also, uh, I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians 4 when it says that Satan is the God of this world. In other words, Satan is the one who is, is directing things in this world. When we talk about following the world versus following Christ, what we're really saying is we're, we're following the influences of the God of this world. We're allowing Satan to call the shots in our lives and to deceive us. Now, I don't think anyone in here would say, I gladly follow Satan. You see, he's too crafty for that. No, you're following influences of the world that he is well craftedly, uh, crafted in a, in, a, in a good way to, to deceive you and, and to trick you. You could really replace that word, no one, I'm telling you this so that the world will not deceive you with well-crafted arguments. You may have a sin issue in your life right now. When I say that, everyone in this room, you probably thought of something a struggle, something that you're going through in your life. And when I think of it, and when you think of it, in a lot of cases, you can probably justify it in some way. You can tell me why it makes sense rationally to do things your way, why if you do things God's way, it doesn't make sense. You've thought through it, you've processed it. Maybe you've even talked to God about it and you've come to some sort of point where you're like, you know what, I'm okay with this sin issue remaining in my life. You've somehow justified it and argued your way around it. You wanna know why that's happened? Because Satan is very crafty and strategic. You started to take direction from the world. See, for many of us, this world through Satan is doing an excellent job capturing our hearts, and we don't even know that we're taking direction really from the world and not from Christ. We've convinced ourselves. And Maybe for you it's, it's substance abuse or your, your drugs or alcohol. Maybe it's, it's uh, an addiction to shopping and you try to, to fill this void inside you by, by buying and consuming things. Maybe, uh, maybe it's a pornography addiction. Maybe it's, uh, you, you have these, these physical flings and you try to find fulfillment from the world through these relationships. And maybe it's all, you know, whatever it is in your life, but whatever it is, you figured out a way to, to somehow make it fit and to make it uh, uh, be, be okay with yourself with that thing being a part of your life. 
That's because Satan is well crafted and well crafty, or is a crafty uh, person who's putting together crafty, well thought out and convincing arguments. You know, 10 years ago, my wife and I, uh, we lost a dog. Uh, we had a dog named Cooper. We got him when we were uh, newlyweds, and Cooper was a Boston Terrier. He was super strong, super smart. He knew every trick in the book. We loved Cooper so much, and Cooper loved us. Uh, and we had a yard that was completely fenced in, and for whatever reason, our dog, though he was well fed anytime he was hungry, there was food, and anytime he was thirsty, there was something to drink, and anytime he wanted someone to love on him, there was someone to love on him. For whatever reason, uh, he had this issue where he, he wanted to get on the other side of our fence. He was willing to dig holes to get underneath it. He was willing to, if the door opened up, he was going to dart out. He wanted to be away from where God had kind of, uh, where we had prepared and pr protected and, and created a spot for him, just like we do that with God. For whatever reason, Cooper wanted to be in the world. He wanted to go out on the other side of God's design and protection of abundance for him. He wanted to be on the other side, just like we do. Right, clearly God didn't have a plan for Cooper to have an abundant life, but God has a plan for you, follower of Christ, to live in abundance. And oftentimes, we, for whatever reason, we want to get on the other side of this fence and we want to get out into the world. Matthew 7, 13 through 14 says it this way. It says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. What this verse is ultimately saying is that when we do things Cooper's way, when we constantly find ourselves wanting whatever is on the other side of God's plan for our lives, when we want to instead take direction from the world instead of direction uh, from God, we, we end up on the other side of this fence. And where does that lead? It leads to death. It leads to destruction. You see, Cooper got out one time and we couldn't find him. And the next day we found out he had been hit by a car and was dead. And I remember still today how devastating it was to, to process the fact that Cooper had everything he, he could have wanted right here. Why, why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we seek the world? Why do we go out and, and allow the world to sit in the place of Christ in our lives? Even clearer in Colossians 2, let's keep reading, verses 6 through 8. It says, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. And listen to this, this verse eight. I'm gonna read it two times so that we don't miss it. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies I love this, and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. What this verse is saying is, listen, church, uh, Satan is crafty. He's going to put together some, some, some thought process, some philosophical arguments, some reason for you to, to, to be okay with living in the world and taking your, your, allowing the world to call shots in your life. And, and the verse is saying, and Paul is saying to the church in Colossae, listen, don't allow this to happen. Don't let anyone trick you. Though it might sound good, it might be like it might sound like it makes sense, you might be able to rationalize it, it might somehow create an argument that makes sense in your life for this thing. Listen, don't be tricked. Instead, put Christ in the place of calling the shots in your life. So what I want to talk about, I want to share with you three ways that you can evict the world from your chair. I believe many of us in our director's chair, we don't realize it, but we're taking direction from the world. We've allowed the world, 
with Satan as its leader and its God to speak into our lives and to direct us. And what we want to do is get him out of that place. So here's three things we can do to evict the world from our chairs. Number one is to grow your roots. I think we all understand the importance of a firm foundation, right? If someone was in the back of the room right now and they were running up here uh, knowing and knew that they were gonna kind of run up here to try to tackle me, I wouldn't stand like this, right? I would, I would widen my stance. I would take a firm, I would try to firm my foundation as much as I could. I'd be, be ready to take whatever was coming so that I wouldn't be knocked over. We understand this concept of a firm foundation. Matthew 7, 25 says, though the rain comes in torrents, and we're, we're experiencing this right now, aren't we? <laughs> though the rain comes in torrents, and the floodwaters rise, and the wind beats against that house, it will not collapse because it is built on bedrock. You know, verse 7 here in chapter 2, it says that you need to let your roots grow down so that your life can be built up. We had a tree out in our parking lot just a few days ago, one of the big ones that fell over into our parking lot. And uh, the, the craziest thing, when you went back behind it, you're expecting to see this whole like root system that kind of came out of the earth with it. But the truth of the matter was the roots, for whatever reason, they were, they were rotten and they were destroyed and this tree just kind of fell and all the, there were no roots. There was nothing keeping this tree firmly planted in the ground. And when the wind came and the floodwaters came and that, that ground got wet, that tree fell over. And that same thing is gonna happen over and over and over again in our lives if we don't firm up our roots. We need to understand that the root system that God's designed for us is so important. And the way that you grow your roots is you spend time with God. Real simply put, you, you gotta spend time in God's word. You have to spend time with him in prayer. You need to get connected with other believers through fellowship, maybe in a life group, uh, coming to corporate worship on a Sunday. These are all great ways that we allow our roots to grow deep so that when the storms and the winds and the lies of this world come and beat against our, our, our bodies and our, our lives, that they won't destroy us and won't knock us over. We see this in Ephesians 4, 13 to 14. It says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then no one will be immature like children. Listen to this. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. In other words, the way that you can make sure that you aren't pushed and over by any sort of lie or any sort of teaching or the world, the way you make sure you get the world out of your chair is to grow in spiritual maturity, to spend time with God learning who he is. And really what it does is it makes you a counterfeit detector. When you understand it so well, when you understand the truth with such a, an incredible amount of, of, of wisdom that you, when you see what's fake in front of you, you can spot it and immediately say, that's not from God, that's from the world. We need to become counterfeit detectors in our faith so that we don't blow any which way the wind takes us. And many of us in this room, I believe that we have something going on in our lives and we've been tricked and we're blowing whichever way the wind blows. Let's keep reading. Colossians chapter two, verses nine and 10. It says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ who is the head over every ruler and authority. You see, this leads us to the second thing. If you want to evict the world from the director's chair, you need to know your identity. You'll see in this verse that it says that, that, that God lives fully in Christ and that Christ, when you give your life to him, lives fully in you. This concept of full. Have you ever been so full that if somebody put your favorite thing in front of you, you wouldn't be able to eat it? 
You know what I'm talking about, right? Where you're feeling a little bit of like acid reflex, but it's not really acid reflex, it's your food that just, there's no room for it. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm so full that if you put an In-N-Out burger in front of me, I would look at it and think, man, I want to eat that, but I can't. That's the kind of full the Bible says you have in Christ. When you give your life to him, your identity is in him alone, fully. There, there is no need. There is no va- void. There's no, there's no need for anything else. And yet we spend our time searching for our identity in this world, just like Cooper. We want to know what is on the other side of the fence, hoping that somehow it'll fulfill something in us. But the truth is our identity is in Christ alone. We need to know our identity. And the third thing is this. You need to abandon your sin. Let's look at Colossians 2.11 together. It says, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. You guys pause for a minute. Is anyone else like super weirded out anytime the word circumcision comes up at church? (laughs) It's one of those words, right, that you can only use uh, in two instances. You can use it at church when it's mentioned in the Bible, and uh, you can use it on the day you have a baby boy born, right? Those are really the only two spots where bringing up circumcision and conversation isn't super awkward. And I told the first service I was going to pay attention uh, to how um, our ASL interpreter assigns uh, <laughs> circumcision. So we're going to find out right now. Circumcision. <laughs> All right. It's good to know. So he, he <laughs> Here's the thing uh, that Paul says about circumcision. He says that when you give your life to Christ, uh, you you experience not necessarily a a physical circumcision, but a spiritual one, that the, the sin nature that was a part of you has been cut off and is no longer a part of you. And here's the thing about this, this concept. Think about this for a moment. If you're like me, you're probably frustrated right now thinking, Matt, I gave my life to Christ I do what I can to follow him, but I still have sin struggles in my life. I still find myself struggling with sin. So Paul's saying that there's this concept of your sin nature being completely cut off and removed. Why is that not the experience in my life? And let me, I'm going to be crude here for a moment to explain this concept. Since we're talking about circumcision. The Bible says that when you give your life to Christ, that you're, your sin nature has been cut off and is no longer a part of you. So what it is that we're doing when we put the world in the chair and we allow sin to continue to be a part of our life is we're basically walking around with what's been cut off in our hand. We're walking around with something that should be discarded in a medical waste basket and destroyed forever. But instead, we walk around with it. It's no longer a part of us, but somehow we we keep it. We hang on to it in case maybe we need it again. And if that picture doesn't like, uh, uh, sorry. Listen, here's the deal. The Bible says that your sin nature has been cut off and is no longer a part of you. Stop walking around with it. Let's keep reading. Colossians 2, 12 through 15 says, For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and you were raised to new life when you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature that was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all of your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities of this world. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. This is the victory that we get to celebrate. Victory over sin, victory over death, victory over Satan, victory over the world. So I want to I wanna ask you a, a so what. What do we do with this? This concept of knowing that we have, for many of us, we have 
the world sitting in a place of authority in our lives, and we recognize a need to get rid of, to ask the world, to, to evict the world from that place, and to put Christ back where he belongs, calling the shots in our lives. We talked about three things that you can do. One, you need to allow your roots to grow deep. You need to spend time getting to know God so that you can be a counterfeit detector and recognize when you're getting a message from the world versus getting a message from Christ. We also talked about the fact you need to know your identity and that in Christ, your identity is in Him alone. You don't need any other identity outside of Him. And the third thing, we need to cut uh, we need to abandon our sin. We need to, th- to get rid of the thing that's been removed from our body. We don't need it anymore. It's gone. It's, it's from the world. We don't need to take direction and carry our sin nature with us anymore. There's, there's a verse in Philippians that was written about non-Christians, and I want to share this with you. It says this, that non-believers, that it says they're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things and they think only about this life here on earth. You know what that verse shows me when it says their God is their appetite? Is people who aren't following Christ, they follow their cravings. They follow whatever is inside them, whatever it is that the world tells them they're hungry for. Non-Christians follow their cravings, but followers of Christ follow Christ. It's not, you know, rocket science, but if you're like me, I'm constantly, Matt, why am I following a craving instead of following Christ? And I think there's a couple reasons uh, why that might happen. If you are in this room right now and you have sin in your life, there's something you're struggling with right now, I want you to know, first and foremost, you are in good company. This church was designed to be a hospital for sinners. So we're really glad you're here. But that sin in your life ought to come and bring up two thoughts. Maybe one is that you've, you've never actually given your life to Christ. Maybe you're going through this thing day by day, and the reason you're taking direction from the world is because you've never accepted Christ as your director. You've never even considered placing him in that place of authority in your life. Don't walk out of this building today without correcting that. Another thing that uh, I think might happen is maybe you, you have decided to follow Christ. You've recognized him as your savior, but for whatever reason, you've dug a hole and you were on the other side of this fence and you were out dabbling in the world and trying to find your identity in the world and your roots are shallow and your sin is great and there's just struggle and things going on in your life. Here's the truth. When Cooper was out there, he was wearing a name tag that told who's he's what, who he was. Anyone looking at that name tag would have known right away that he belonged to to my wife and I. You have a name tag. You belong to God. And he wants you back within the folds of the good and abundant plan he has for your life. But the sin things that are going on, the, the fact that your roots are shallow, that you're getting pushed and pulled every way by this world, they're gonna keep you from that abundance. So here, here's what I wanna do to, to close. I wanna as we go into this next song here in a moment, I'm gonna open up this space up here. We, we sometimes call it the altar. And, and I want, and we're not normally a church culture where people feel comfortable coming forward and spending time up here, but I'm gonna ask that you just ignore that. I'm gonna join you. If there is something in your life if there's a sin issue or something, some business with God that you need to take care of to get the world out of its, his seat and put Christ back in it, I want to invite you to come and just kneel at this altar and spend time with, in prayer with, with Christ as we sing. Like I said, I'm going to be coming around here. I have some things I need to spend time with God talking about, and I want to invite you to do the same. Let's pray together. God, we ask that you would be mightily glorified in our desire and our passion to put you in the place of direction and authority in our lives. God, I recognize that in my own life there are so many places where I I listen to the world and I allow the world to call shots in my own life. And God, I pray that right now I can spend some time uh, making that right, God, that as we sit here at this altar in front of this director's chair that we can recognize that this 
spot, this place of authority in our lives, that you're the only one worthy of that, of that seat. And I pray that anyone in this room that's struggling with a sin issue, that they're struggling with their time with you, they're struggling in their faith, God, they, that maybe they need to, to decide to follow you for the first time, that anyone that fits into any of those things would feel comfortable and courageous and be willing to come up here and, and spend some time on their knees at your altar. And we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.